our next panel is, is about exactly this subject. Uh, we're calling it the, the death of till death do us, do us part, with a question mark at the end. And it's going to look at the impact of extended human life and health on family and social relationships. Our moderator is Liza Mundy, who is the director of the New America Foundation's Work and Family Program, which seeks to reframe the conversation to reflect the enormous changes that have taken place within families, workplaces, and the lives of men and women over the past several decades. Uh, Liza is one of the foremost journalists writing about family, gender, and work issues. Uh, she's written for publications including The Atlantic, Time, The New Republic, Slate, of course, uh, Mother Jones, and lots of others. And uh, like Joel, she was a staff writer for The Washington Post. Uh, and she's the author of the excellent book, The Richer Sex, How the New Majority of Female Breadwinners is Transforming Sex, Love, and Family. And Liza, where are you? Liza is going to introduce the panel there. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be here. I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, I'll introduce our panelists. We are really fortunate to have um, two great discussants of uh, how technology and longevity are going to affect our, our personal lives and our relationships. Um, we have Sonia Arison, who is a technology analyst and author of the national bestseller 100 Plus, How the Coming Age of Longevity Will Change Everything from Careers and Relationships to Family and Faith. And, uh, and if you all want to come up and take these two chairs, I think I'll um, sit in this one. And she's based in San Francisco, where she's been director of the Technology Studies Department at the Pacific Research Institute. She's a founder, <laughs> academic advisor, and trustee at Singularity University. She's focused on exponentially growing technologies and their impact on society. Her work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, MSNBC, and The Today Show. And we're also fortunate to have Chris Hackler, who is um, the recently retired director of the Division of Medical Humanities at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Medicine. For more than a decade, he was a Woodrow Wilson visiting fellow of the Council of Independent Colleges and lectured at medical schools and college campuses around the country and abroad. He's written books and articles on end-of-life decisions and on rationing and healthcare reform in the context of an aging population. He's currently working on social issues in the use of genetic and reproductive technologies. So we will get started with what we hope will be an invigorating conversation, and we will open it up to questions after about 30 minutes, unless we start to flag, and then we'll open it up sooner. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, it, as, as, as Jacob said, I'm a former uh, staff writer for the Washington Post, and I wanted just very briefly to kind of frame our conversation. One of the first stories that, one of the first articles that came to mind thinking about this topic is a piece I did a couple of years ago for the Washington Post magazine looking at a situation, um, uh, a man in this area named Dave Kendall, a wonderful man, a federal worker ordinary, living in the suburbs. His wife was diagnosed in her late 40s with Huntington's disease, which is, I'm sure you know, is a degenerative neurological disease. Um, uh, something that he was only about 50, it came as obviously a great surprise to both of them. When I got to know him a couple of years into their ordeal, he was taking extraordinarily good care of his wife, Diana, in their home in the Virginia suburbs. He had, um, he had, he, he works with his hands. He had set up sort of uh, amazing systems in his home to transport her as her mobility declined. So it's interesting because we talk about the death of till death do us part. He had a very, very strong conviction about marriage um, and about marital caregiving. And it was his very strong view, and he lived it until her end, uh, that they were in it you know, until death do us part, and that it was his job to be her caregiver and her caretaker. And there is no question, although she um, is no longer alive, that he extended through his caregiving her longevity. So we can talk about technology and robots and everything, and that's all great, but human caregiving in terms of extending our lifespan and the quality of our life is something that we can't forget about. Uh, so so people, I mean, he, every day he got up and went to his federal job, he's probably furloughed right now, um, but then he came home every night to, you know, a second shift in which he was taking really inspirational and extraordinarily care of his wife and extending her lifespan and extending for him the situation he was living in. Uh, so that's one uh, story that I thought about that had a lot of personal meaning for me. 
in my own life, uh, my mother, who is 79, and, um, and, and just the other day, uh, she lives in Richmond, she called Eric Cantor to fuss at him um, because she's, well, his office, because she's worried about us. Um, it, she, she married uh, for the second time in her life at 78 to another 78-year-old uh, man, and uh, it has been an extraordinary blessing in our family to see the happiness and the companionship and the mutual caregiving that they have enjoyed together. And there's no question, again, in my mind that through their tending, loving tending of each other, that they will also have an impact I, I hope on each other's longevity and and you know and live long and prosper is is the hope of of them and everybody in our family. So this subject has a lot of personal meaning for me, and the just the final sort of intellectual. Um, framework, I would think of when we talk about why we're living longer, there are all sorts of technological reasons, but there's also an interesting theory called the grandmother hypothesis that also relates to this, which is that when, when, um, when evolutionary biologists and anthropologists think about why do women live past menopause, why do women live past their reproductive years and uh, their ability to you know, have children, uh, one of the answers to this mystery is what they call the grandmother hypothesis, which is, again, that one reason we live longer as a species is because we have grandmothers who can take care of the children while the, um, while the, the parents are out there foraging for nuts and berries or hunting or whatever, that the grandmothers are taking care of the children and extending their longevity, and that long-lived women who thereby enable their daughters and daughters-in-law to have lots of children will pass along their genes. So both sort of genetically and through their caregiving, grandmothers have had a major influence on, on extending the human lifespan. So I guess I would just like to keep in mind the importance of social relationships, companionship, and caregiving, both at the beginning of life in terms of caring for children, but as we live into the, you know, into our hundreds, what what are going to be the marriage patterns? I mean, we're in a society now where uh, people in their 30s increasingly aren't getting married. People who are having children increasingly aren't getting married. So, like my mom, is she an outlier? Uh, what what are the, going to be the patterns that emerge as people live? How are we going to ensure that these people who have cared for us and extended our lifespans um, and eventually ourselves are, are going to continue to have the human companionship and the caregiving that will make their lives happy as, as they get old. So uh, let's start with, let's start with Sonia. Um, where, where are we going? How, how are we going to ensure that people could continue to have companionship and as, as they move into these glorious? Well, I think years. it depends on what scenario we're talking about. Um, and I think that was really useful, Joel, that you had those you know, four different scenarios up there. Uh, in my book, 100 Plus, I, I take a look at the scenario C, basically. You know, what happens when human beings can roughly double their life expectancy? Again, it's already been done. And not just life expectancy, but like you say, health expectancy. People are healthy for longer periods of time. Um, you know, what is, how does that change the world? And that's essentially what my book looks at. And I have a chapter on family where, you know, it's like, I take a look at how, you know, I go back in time and say, you know, what happened the last time we roughly doubled life expectancy? Well, what happened is age at first marriage went up, um, uh, age at first birth went up, but it hasn't gone up as much as you would expect. So in 1950, uh, you know, age at first marriage was around 20 for women. Today it's around 27. So it's gone up about seven years. Um, which, you know, is, and longevity has gone up quite a bit since then. I mean, in 1943, uh, uh, sorry, in, yeah, in, in 1950, so, uh, I'm trying to get my longevity numbers here. <laughs> I feel like there's, there's too many numbers going around in my well, head. Enough. Right, so we've, got, we've gone essentially from 43 years to 80 years, right? So we've, we've roughly doubled life expectancy. Um, but... You'd think that age of first marriage would go up higher, and you'd think that people would have children later, but it hasn't as right. much as you would expect. And I think the reason for that is because of fertility has stayed stuck, right? I mean, even with IVF, women are having children later, but not, you know, there's still this point at, you know, between 40 and 50 where fertility really starts to tank. And by 50, it's, it's over if you want to have your own biological children. Um, now, uh, some women have had 
donated eggs and have had children at, you know, we've seen a 66-year-old have a child and a 70-year-old have a child using their uterus but not their own eggs. And so the question really is what happens to fertility over the long run, I think. And, you know, if, if fertility can be extended, then age at first marriage is really going to pop up quite a bit. Well, what has gone up <coughs> is unmarriage. Uh, yes, uh, right, uh, yes. Almost a straight Not, line yeah. parallel with the uh, increase in the average lifespan over the last 100, 150 years has gone uh, the rate of divorce. And since 1990, the rate of divorce of people over 50 has doubled. And so that's, I think, what we really need right. to deal with at this point. Not so much the age at which we get married, but how long we stay married. And right. that's the real difficulty that I see because... Why are people getting divorced more? Well, because they have longer lives after their children are gone and a longer period to become a little bit bored or, you know, and uh, seek new exciting relationships, and that's what's happening. And if we live to be 150, uh, how many people in this room would uh, want to stay married for 100 years? I mean, it's really, uh, you know. Now, we don't want to say that to our wives who are sitting next to us or our husbands, but in the general population, that's going to be a real problem. And Sonia, you've really uh, dealt with that, haven't you? I mean, you've talked a little bit about uh, uh, remarriage. Sure, over... yeah. I mean, you can expect, to, I think, in the future to see much more serial <coughs> relationships, marriages, divorces, or even not getting married and right. just having a whole bunch of serial relationships, right. Right. Um, much more than we see today. So serial yeah. cohabitation into one's hundreds. Right, and then if fertility pops up where women can have children, you know, post-50, you can imagine the different types, different family types as well where, you know, a woman might have a child in her late 20s and then have another one in her 60s and have, like, different types of families, and the extended family looks a lot different in, in that scenario. But, you know, uh, you, your, your first story was so, so important, I think, to frame the discussion because here's a relationship that is enduring past infirmity and real difficulty, and it's so important to those two people. And we can talk about, well, serial relationships, and you have a contract for 30 years or 25 years and move on. But that's difficult. I mean, it's not as easy as it sounds. Not as easy these, as it sounds it, yeah. these are intimate, important relationships, right. and it's important that we have these relationships. And I'm not sure if it would be the same thing to be married for 30 years and to go into it knowing that in 30 years you're going to be choosing somebody else or... Uh, or, or having to decide whether to stay with this or go. And, and these are humanly difficult kinds of uh, uh, concerns that I'm not sure how we're going to resolve. Right. And, and actually, we have, with this wonderful man, Dave Kendall, we had this conversation because, I mean, as people are able to leave longer, live longer with chronic illnesses, this is, this is marital caregiving is, is becoming more common. And it was, his, it was his absolute conviction that he was in it you know, but 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 there are actually support groups for for people who are in these long term care of giving situations, and I think most of the people in his support group felt, you know, actually when you're in an acute situation like this, having a relationship on the side is okay. That wasn't his view. His view was, I'm married to her until death do us part. Um, I think he departed actually from a lot of the people he was in a support group with about sort of what are what are what is the what does the marital contract mean. Um, when one person is as infirm as, as his wife was. You know, you brought up the idea uh, that uh, if we live to be 150, we could have children generations apart, and that really right. is going to change what the family looks like. Um, currently, it's pretty rare to have five generations alive at the same time. I know in my own family, right. Right. Um, a young cousin, uh, four times removed, I guess, uh, has a great-great-grandmother, so I've got four generations but when you extend that a little bit further, the family tree begins to look really top-heavy. I mean, if you have four generations, you have, what, 16, 32 great-great-great-grandparents, and then one more generation, you have 64. And so this family tree looks like right. this. Right, right, And what do you do when you, know, you need to send out graduation announcements? Or, uh, <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, uh, we, we need to, we're going to need a new right. set of etiquette books to right. be able to resolve these problems of how we uh, bring people together, who we bring together, who's part of the family and who's not part of the family. Right. And, and just one more point, I think the further we get in age from those who came before us, the, uh, uh, the, the less intimacy there is in those relationships. I mean, how you relate to your great-great-great-grandmother is really going to be different from how you relate to your grandmother. And 
Uh, this, this is all new stuff right. for us. So we think, we think of the human pattern of descendants as being sort of, you know, we're descended from a common ancestor and then it goes like this. But you're <laughs> talking about a situation where it's you, like you, this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have a young person here with two parents and each of those has two and each of those has two. Right. And it goes up exponentially and it's not long. It's like six, six generations and you have 64 great, great, great grandparents. Right. Right. I mean, it, I can see how that plays out in my own family. I mean, I have I have younger half siblings, but now with my mother's remarriage, my my daughter was talking to me yesterday, and she made she said something about your sister. And I thought, what are you talking about? What what sister are you talking about? And she meant the the adult children of my stepfather, and who some of whom we've met, not all of whom we've met. And 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 it is. I mean, on the one hand, it's wonderful. We 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 really like this family, and but it is it is a whole new set of relationships to navigate. So. As we potentially, you know, as we have this really long adult period of our life, and then sort of the super adult period, yeah, we can move through serial relationships, but it does, we end up with a horizontal family that can grow, and then the family is growing vertically as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, and it is a, lot to na it's a lot to navigate. Yeah. If we have three or four marriages and we have children mm -hmm. with each of those, I mean, if we slow the rate of human aging so that we live longer, I guess the period of fertility would last longer, although we don't know for sure. Right. But it's possible to have um, um, brothers and sisters from three or four different marriages. And right. what is that relationship going to be like? The sibling relationship is, especially when you spread them apart by 60 years or so, it's going to be very, very different. Right. You know, it, it struck me actually also coming in that we haven't had, there was a period in the sort of mid-aughts where we were having a lot of world's oldest mother news stories. You know, there was like, you know, a 70-something mother of twins in Italy or wherever, and there was a series where they seemed to be surpassing each other. And it's been kind of quiet on the world's oldest mother front for a while. And, <laughs> I'm, point. and I, I'm not I, sure why I that is. That there are always a couple of fertility doctors, rogue fertility doctors, who are willing to really push it. And... Um, I, I actually I actually wrote about reproductive technologies and uh, one of my first book and um, and it was really an extraordinary thing. I mean, in in the realm of reproductive technology, doctors really were winging it. And I mean, one of the one of the case studies that was so shocking was they were they were really not sure whether you could bring a woman out of menopause by giving her hormones and and then um, using egg donation. And they they really didn't know. So they were like, let's try it. And so they did. And one of the case studies I read that was shocking was you know quadruplets in a 54-year-old mother. Yeah. And, and that was a case where select, selective reduction was used at least to create a more manageable pregnancy for a woman in her mid-50s. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the way in which the fertility industry has pushed that and been willing to sort of wing it and experimentally see what's possible was leading to these cases of, you know, 72-year-old mother of twins. And yet, uh, and I'm not quite sure why this is. We just, I, I'm waiting for, for a new one to kind of, may, maybe we reached our limit with, I don't know what that, the, the upper age was. I don't remember if it was 68 or 72, but maybe we've sort of pushed that as far as we can. Or maybe it doesn't really seem that interesting anymore and it's sort of happening and it's not being reported on all that much. Maybe, maybe, um, yeah. And there are consequences. I mean, uh, it, women who had children with egg donation in their 50s, I mean, don't always live to be 100. And then you do have yeah. cases of children who become sort of marooned and, and, and potentially parentless. Yeah, and, well, Carmen and, Bosada, who had children, she was sort of one of the first older mothers who had, uh, she was in Spain, who had uh, twins at 66, which seemed really quite old until the 70-year-old came along. Um, and, you know, her, her mother lived past 100, and so she thought she was going to too. Two years after she had those twins, she died of stomach cancer. So it doesn't always quite work out. Right. She was a little ahead of her time. Right, right. Um, but again, I, I guess I do wonder, sort of in terms of social policy, um, what, what we do, I mean, we have countries like Japan, where you have um, traditionally, you know, when a woman married, uh, it was the expectation that she would become the sort of caregiver, not only for her husband, but for her extended family. And so in countries in traditional societies like that, you've had these aging populations. You have women who no longer want to enter into that marriage contract because they don't want to have the responsibility for um, you know, taking care of extended generations. Uh, we don't necessarily have those expectations in our society, but what, how, how is it going to play out as people, not only in terms of marriage, but just 
as, as people get old, I mean, it's great to think that they're going to be able to spit into something and, and um, extend their own lifespans, but they're, they're going to need to be cared for. And what, are we going to have, you know, are we going to have institutional care or are we going to have family-based care? And, and how are we going to, how are we going to manage that? How are we going to get ourselves where we want to be? Where do we want to be? Um, I know one of my biggest concerns as I'm now just retiring and facing older age is uh, toward the end of life, who's going to take care of me? And fortunately, I have a younger wife, so she can do that for a good while. But yeah, but I think that there, uh, as there are more people without people to take, help take care of them, our institutions will have to develop. I mean, assisted living is sort of a new industry now, and it's been a great boon for my own father, who just died at 95 a few months ago. Uh, and so... Um, I think the you know, the private sector will will develop new institutions to help take care of people. It'll have to be done. So that's what it's going to be. It's going to be the private sector, uh, sector well, assisted living facilities. Yeah. Know, it would be nice right. if we could have 100-year marriages where right. people would continue right. to take, but I don't right. think that's going to happen. Right. It, seems it, it all depends on what the scenario looks like. I mean, I feel like we're popping back and forth between different scenarios. I mean, if we're living in scenario C, then everyone's fairly, I mean, you're nine years old and you're still healthy. You don't need a okay. caregiver at that okay. point. But if you're looking at a different scenario, like scenario B or, you know, A, then <coughs> caregivers are really important. And so, you know, which, right. which scenario is it? And, you know, we're thinking about uh, radically extending the lifespan, and we would do that, I would think, by slowing down the rate of human aging. And, and also... What's telling us about uh, what causes aging and how to uh, slow it down is also telling us what causes age-related diseases. And so if we live <coughs> to be 150, <coughs> excuse me, it's not that we'll just keep getting older and more frail and sicker and sicker. Uh, we'll be healthy okay. for most of that time. Uh, that, at least that's the hope. And, well, and it does depend on what technology um, allows human beings to live longer and healthier lives, right? I mean, even if we buy into scenario C, how does it happen and how quickly does it happen? I mean, the the gold standard, I mean, the best way to do that would be to slow down aging, maybe through some genetic tweak, but that's a long way off. Before that happens, there's going to be other things um, like personalized medicine and tissue engineering, and so replacing the human parts. So somebody has a heart disease, you know, today we manage it through pharmaceuticals and lifestyle and all that, that kind of thing. I mean, in the future, scientists, and this really isn't that far off, will be able to grow brand new heart parts or an entire new heart for somebody, and then they're just repaired. And so that fixes the heart, but then they still, they keep living, and then maybe they get Alzheimer's. And then, you know, so, and will we be at the point where we can also fix our brain right away? Unclear. So it, it kind of depends on which technology when and, and how quickly it happens. Right. The thing that I keep thinking, though, is that if we're looking at people who are paired, and, you know, we're presumably a pair bonding species. Uh, one person might be healthy. You're, you're going to be really lucky if you both track on, you know, as healthy as each other, you know, going forward. But I still think there's always going to be a scenario if you're in a relationship where one person might be healthier than the other person and they're going to be caring or, you know, the families. Somebody's going to have to be taking you to these heart replacement appointments, you know. It's, it's, it's never going to be something, I think, that you're doing on your own. Um, so... Um, why don't we go ahead and open it up to questions, because I, I suspect that there will be quite a few. Um, okay, you had the first hand on? Oh, is there, there's a mic coming around. Sorry, I thought, I thought there was. All right. Hello, I'm Dale Doucette. I live in DuPont Circle. I'm 82 years old. Uh, I went to a, um, uh, an internment at my church, St. Mark's uh, Capitol Hill, uh, last week, and uh, we interned one of my ex-girlfriends. And it ended up that she had had uh, three husbands. I did not know that when I dated her. And all three showed up. And uh, I thought, this was a real good sociological study because she had three sons who did very well from the first husband. She had three more children from her second. Uh, and uh, each of her ex-husbands had gone on and remarried and had families. And I was thinking this was a large uh, internment. 
there were a lot of people there that had never met each other. Uh, and they got along beautifully. And so I asked two of the husbands, because one sat on one side of me and one sat on the other side of me. And uh, they liked each other. And they said, uh, what a, a great person she was. And uh, I was thinking, this is the new world we live in. But you talk about multiples. When you take her, her children, her ex's children, and their children, you got an enormous number of grandchildren from her. Uh, I can't remember. It was like 16 or 18, and her great-grandchildren jumped to us astronomical figure. So uh, that's the new world we live in. Um, and what age did she yeah. die? What age was she uh, when she in died? In her 70. I'm uh, sorry? So uh, I, I think that's, that's going to become the norm. And who your relatives are is going to become an extremely complicated, because we were trying to figure out what, how do you explain relatives? And there are no terms out there. Exactly. Uh, for this. We don't have the language. Uh, Emily Post. Now, the other thing which is more important is that I live in DuPont Circle. Uh, I am um, <clears throat> president of the board of directors of uh, an organization that puts DuPont Circle together. And one of the organizations in DuPont Circle is called The Village. Now let me just, before I explain this, how many people know what a village is? That's pretty good, because uh, you talked uh, about going to these uh, retirement homes. This is a concept that's going to, I think, in the long run, replace that. So you've got a whole new concept to start thinking about. A village is you stay in your home. You get the same services that you get at a retirement home, but you stay where you are with a and where you know things, and everybody knows you, and you keep the same friendships. And those friendships are really, really, really important. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and that it gives a whole new concept of aging in place. Right. That, those are great comments. So did, did, did either of yeah, you? I mean, just uh, say my undergraduate college has just finished building a village mm -hmm. uh, that has all those advantages you just talked about, plus a college, a vibrant college across the street where people can go and sit in on courses and uh, keep alive. I think it's a wonderful well, idea. Uh, American University has a program, an extensive program for elder people. So you, did you? Uh, can sign up for it. Did you have a comment also? Just in um, response to his? Well, I, I loved your comment about how there were so many different um, different husbands and different people. And um, you know that really is the beginning of the future. Uh, and you know, you're 82. It's funny because normally when I go around and give talks on my book, I like to ask, you know, I like to ask the audience how long they think they want to live. You know, life expectancy in America is generally mm -hmm. around 80 years. Mm -hmm. Would you? Mm -hmm. Would you? Who here wants to live to 80 years? We know you want to live yeah. longer, yeah. right? And who wants to live to 150 <laughs> or indefinitely? <laughs> Are the <laughs> yeah, so it, it's interesting because mm -hmm. usually if we hadn't had an 82-year-old speak, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, 80 years sounds good <laughs> until <laughs> We're you see, out. yeah, at least 100. Yeah. yeah. So uh, next question, the gentleman here, uh, can we get the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, yes, right here. Sorry. Good morning. I'm John Rother. I spent a lot of time working at ARP. Uh, so two facts and an observation. Uh, fact number one is most people who will need support in old age are widows. And uh, we can't really look to the spouses uh, for them. The men may be more fortunate, particularly if you have the younger, healthier spouse. But, but statistically, we're talking about widows right. here. Second observation is that the studies that I've been uh, familiar with that look at quality of life and length of life show, unfortunately, that spousal caregiving is a major risk factor for shortening your life. Mm, the mm -hmm, stress, right, the right. stress is huge. Right. 
and the lack of support from policy. So my, my uh, observation is uh, people who are going to increasingly be facing this need alone are going to have to look to their communities and to public policy, uh, not just their families, for all of the reasons right. we've been talking right. about. Right, right, thank you. Uh, question, what, do you want to um, pick somebody from the back? From Good morning, I'm Alan Abel from the Toronto National Post. One of the, I want to ask John Smart, who was one of the founders of the idea of the singularity of a computer whose processing speed exceeds that of the human brain. How do you think supercomputers will deal with us? And he said, we'll be their houseplants. My thought is why, what you would think, why would we think, if you extrapolate how dependent we are now on our phones, on Facebook, on our technology, think of a six-year-old with his handheld video games, why assume that we'll need human companionship at all. Hmm. Uh, if you look at the, hmm. the New York Times Magazine story a couple of weeks okay. ago about the new poker machines okay. that virtually can replicate any scenario of human interaction over a, a hand of poker, why not assume that, that Google will take care of that also? Why, why think there'll be any need for it? So there'll be something to hold your, somebody to hold be your something hand? Which can speak and interact so, and, oh, and oh, have yeah, memories okay, and all that. Good. Why, okay, why not uh, assume no need for human interaction? Okay. So I, I think John Smart probably made that comment, assuming that computing power would, be, would become more intelligent um, without our input. And I'm, I'm not sure that that's really an accurate way of viewing the future. You know, it's like ultimately human beings are the ones who are developing this technology. It gets created because we need it, because there's a use for it, and we want it. Um, now, John Smart might say something like, well, at some point, computers will just get so smart that they'll start developing them themselves and we'll be out of the equation, and you can talk about that, but I mean, I don't think that's anywhere in the near future, and before we get there, we're, we're going to get to living to 150 before we get to his scenario, and the technology that we develop is going to be technology that we want, that keeps us healthier longer, and that integrates with our lives, and in that sense, nothing will change from, from the perspective of we do like companionship and we like to be around other people. So, and so Chris, what do you think? I mean, are we going to get to a point where all these widows, uh, they're going to be able to play, you know, solitaire, I mean, they're going to be able to play um, Scrabble with other widows and so uh, it's going to, or poker or whatever, and so that the social networking is going to actually solve this need for human companionship later on? Well, we certainly need human companionship uh, in addition to our computers, and I think we always will. <laughs> and, and I so wouldn't say we it has be to be between men and women. I mean, any, any human, close human intimate relationship is uh, very important. I don't know if I answered your question. Well, the question is, will we be able to get it through our computers so we won't well, need to have the proximity? That. I mean, that, that raises an old philosophical issue about uh, the, uh, could uh, artificial intelligence have emotions as well right. as intelligence? And I can't add anything really to that. It's a big literature about that. Okay. Um, how about up here at the front? I'm sorry, I'm making you walk back and forth. I'm trying to be. <laughs> um, hello, I'm William Angel. Um, and given, if we look at scenario C, where over the next 17 to 20 years, life expectancy jumps between 60 and 80 years, that rap do you think that that rapid increase in growth would not affect the, you know, the current trend of delayed marriage? Or do you think that it would... That, that sudden increase, more so than the you know, quarter of a year we've had for a long time, do you think that that would drastically change the current, the current trend of delayed marriage? I think what will happen, I mean, it does, de it does depend on how quickly um, people start to live longer and healthier lives, right? I mean, if it, if it comes on really fast, I, I think people won't know what to do right away. <laughs> And they'll keep following whatever patterns they're following. Um, you know, I, th I think in the f what it really means in the future is that we're going to have a lot more diversity in relationships and in you know when people get married. I mean, they'll s even when it's established that people can live to 150 in a, in a healthy state, there's still going to be people who get married at 20 and then divorce at 25 and, and keep going, right? I mean, they'll just have more time to do that. Uh, and but then they'll also be the people. I think probably a more general trend, because what we've seen in the past is age at first marriage keeps going up. 
probably it'll, instead of being 27, it'll pop up to, you know, 35, maybe, something like that, and, and, and keep growing. And I think age at first marriage will, will continue to increase for sure, especially if fertility, I think it's really linked to fertility because a lot of women feel pressure to get married and have kids so they can meet that 40-year mark. And I'm speaking from personal experience here. <laughs> Although increasingly we have egg freezing and sperm donation and ways that women can push it. Um, you can push it, but not your own biological right. kids. I mean, right. well, with egg freezing you can. Yes, but egg freezing doesn't work very well because eggs have a high water content yep, and I when know. you freeze yep. it, it breaks. They don't freeze the well. Cellular no, embryos. Yep. There yes. is new technology now where scientists can freeze uh, pieces of uh, ovarian tissue. Right. And ovarian tissue is full of tiny, tiny little miniature eggs. And We've always known that. But the problem that scientists had after that is how do you get these immature eggs that are in the ovarian right. tissue, how do you mature them so that you can actually go through an IVF cycle? Right. Um, and that breakthrough actually happened a couple years ago. And so, in some so cases, now they we're at the point them under the skin so that they can be... Yes, right. It can right. be. And right. in fact, anyway, there was just a news hit a couple of months ago where... Uh, so ovarian tissue, if you take it out and then re-implant it in, um, within the woman, it, the eggs mature on their own just naturally. Right. But it was always thought that you had to put it back like where the ovaries were. Right. But just like a month ago or something, it was they took that tissue and implanted it just in the stomach. And it still worked. Right. So it's right. You know, biology is sort of magical right. that way. Right. And then you can solve your work life balance problems because right. you can go ahead and work <laughs> and then you can have your children when you're retiring. And then the whole concept well, of you know what well, this I mean You know what this I mean, this kind of technology brings up an issue that we haven't talked about yet and that a few people have mentioned to me when, when I talk about this technology is, you know, baby factories. If you, if you can take out immature eggs, and that's like a crazy kind of term, but if you can take out immature eggs and mature them in the lab, which is possible, then maybe you can just like create the whole thing outside of someone's body and the women don't have to be responsible for it anymore. I mean, that would change a lot. You could even have a deceased father sperm donor you and could. have a deceased mother who has donated the eggs and have a baby born and incubated in a little box. They're being developed so that the baby can be, so that it can be incubated outside the body right. and, that and have a baby a born with issues. no father and no mother. <laughs> what, have we done something good or not? <laughs> uh, question. I'm sorry, you've had your hand up for quite some time, right, right here in the, um, yes, in the open college chair, yes. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Don Cayley. You've talked a lot about uh, the quantitative um, regarding marriage, but I, my question is about the qualitative. It, uh, it seems to me that when we were agrarian and early industrial, it was really an economic institution. It was something that we relied on um, um, for our own longevity. Um, it's shifted in the last 50 years, you could tell me better than, than I know, uh, into more an emotional institution right. where people marriage, do it for pleasure or for uh, their enjoyment. What is, is it going to shift again to something different than that? Or is that going to mature in a way that we haven't been able to uh, observe yet? I'm, I'm just curious about your thoughts. Thank you. I think you're right that the reason for getting married has changed. Uh, it used to be a religious uh, commitment or a social or a family kind of thing to bring families together. And property. And, and property, right. Now it's for personal happiness, I think, in almost, uh, in, at least in countries like ours. And as the purpose of marriage is personal happiness, as people become unhappy and have longer periods to become, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. become unhappy, mm -hmm. you have unmarriage or divorce. So I, maybe that was the trend we began with, and I think that maybe helps explain I it. think the big change because of that is there will be a throwback to the past. There will be a throwback to the extended family, where, which we haven't seen that much of. But you know, the more that people get married and um, we see different families being created and they're all together, their families just get bigger and more diverse. And that was part of the same-sex marriage debate also, was what is the purpose of marriage? And part of the opposition to same-sex marriage would say, well, it's a pro that got this procreative purpose. And then you can point to these older marriages and say, you know, obviously it doesn't. I mean, obviously for many people it's about companionship and happiness. And that was a big part of the debate. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one more question. James Sag, um, life expectancy is a number derived from the distribution. As you talk about life expectancy getting longer, do you expect the whole distribution that we have right now just to shift upwards with the fixed variance? Or could you imagine that, for example, this room might, people in this room might represent 
a small peak at one end and a large tail going down? And if that's the case, what kind of social pressures would you expect? I'm sorry, what do you mean Not by sure distribution? Or do you, uh, what do you mean by distribution? Average of that, and I can expect, I can imagine a situation. In fact, you sort of talked about that in scenario B, where there's, an, there's a small group of people who benefit from all the technology, get very long lives, and then I think there was one guy who died before everything happened because he smoked and stuff like that. And so you wind up with a bimodal distribution, or else a, a distribution with a peak at one end, people in this room maybe because they look pretty affluent, and then a long tail going down, and maybe even a peak at, that hasn't moved at all from now. And I'm, I'm wondering what the social implications right. of that would be. Right, right, if there's a longevity divide where you have some people right. in society living right. a lot longer than other people, which we already have today, by the way. Within the US, there's a 30-year gap between some of the people who, you know, I think it's North Dakota, and a Native American man there lives to be right. around 50, and in New Jersey, an Asian American woman can live to be 91. Um, and so it, there's, there's already big gaps within our own country, and internationally, they're even bigger. It's like a 50-year gap internationally. Um, so if that gap continues to grow, I mean, the, the question is, is how quickly does technology roll out, right? I mean, do, do life-extending technologies, do they, do they roll out quickly, like, you know, like cell phones and the internet did, or are they slower? And uh, if there's a slower period of time, then, then there will be those big gaps, and I think there will be big social gaps, changes, differences between groups, and that could be really destabilizing. And differences yeah. across national boundaries, too, because right. uh, in wealthy countries such as ours, it may be rather widely available, but in Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia, right. it's not going right. to be, and that is potential for a really a destabilized world order, it seems yeah. to me. And we okay. have to take that seriously. Well, on that note, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, thank you so much. Did you have a, a comment that you wanted to make? Oh, I, <clears throat> really, I was just going to say we've talked about marriage and the family to this point, but uh, the, the current political situation makes me realize that uh, our politicians would live longer, too, and uh, <laughs> we would have members of Congress sitting on committees for maybe 40, 50, 60 years, or Supreme Court justices. Supreme Court, this right. is a life right. Uh, appointment. Right. Right, we may right, have to right. face constitutional issues right. at a certain point because right. we wouldn't want people sitting there. Oh, how interesting. Long. Yes, thank you. Yes, the quarreling could just go on forever. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you so much. This has been a great panel. Thank you all so much.